For this session, let's talk about moon phases. So there's a couple of properties of the moon that we want to identify. First is that we only ever from the Earth see one side of the moon. So let's you know call this the moon. I know I've been using this as the northern hemisphere. This is the southern hemisphere. We're going to change this up and just kind of say that this is the moon uh, rotating on its axis. So as the moon rotates on its axis, it's also going to be orbiting around the Earth. And it happens to be the case that it takes the same amount of time, or pretty much the same amount of time, for the moon to rotate once on its axis as it does to orbit once around the Earth, approximately once per month. And what this means is if we have these two kinds of motions, let's say the Earth is here and the moon is orbiting around the Earth, but the moon is also rotating on its own axis. Well, if we combine those two motions and if those two motions take the same amount of time per orbit or per revolution, what we're gonna get is that one side of, if the Earth is right here, one side of the moon is always pointed towards the Earth, and one side of the moon is always pointed away from the Earth. We call this uh, the near side and the far side of the moon, sometimes referred to as the dark side of the moon, um, but that's a bit of a misnomer, so we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. This is an example of something called synchronous rotation. And this kind of synchronous rotation actually happens pretty commonly. Uh, it's not just a coincidence that this is set up for the Earth. A lot of moons that are in orbit around larger planets, a lot of moons have this kind of synchronous rotation. This happens for all of Jupiter's uh, four Galilean moons. So for the four Galilean moons, uh, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, they are all tidally locked with Jupiter in this way. The same side of the moon always is pointing towards the planet. In fact, for the dwarf planet Pluto and its largest moon, Charon, it's actually double tidally locked. So if this is Pluto and this is Charon, both of those, the rotation rate of Charon, the orbital time for Charon, and the rotation rate of Pluto are all locked with each other. So a quarter of an orbit later, Pluto will be on its side, Charon will be on its side, and they'll remain locked with each other. They'll be doing the same thing the entire time. So that's a case of a system that is double tightly locked. So again, it's, it's not just a coincidence that the moon and the Earth are the moon is locked with the rotation of its with its rotation around the Earth in this particular way. This happens for a lot of systems. Now, the moon produces no visible light of its own. The light that we see from the moon is just reflected sunlight. So even though there's only one half of the moon that's ever pointed towards the Earth, that's not necessarily the side that is being illuminated by the sun. Also notice that there are some additional motions. If you watch this, the moon does get a little bit closer and a little bit further away from the Earth because it has an elliptical orbit. And it also does have this little bit of wobbly motion to it as well, again, owing to kind of a leftover portion of this process of getting it tidally locked. So our view of the moon, which side of it's illuminated, which side we can see, that changes and causes the moon to go through these apparent phase, uh, uh, phases. Again, just because we call the far, sometimes call the far side of the moon the dark side of the moon, doesn't mean that it is always in shadow or something. It's just not the side that is facing towards the Earth. This is a bit of an animation to try to show how the view of the moon changes over the course of a month as the moon orbits around the Earth. Let's say sunlight is coming in from this side. Okay? Well, then that left side of the moon is always the side of the moon that's illuminated. However, it's not always the side of the moon that is pointed towards the Earth. So as the moon goes around this orbit, if the sunlight is coming in from this way, 
our view of the moon and which part of it is illuminated from our perspective is going to change. And this whole process takes around four weeks to go through this full set of transitions from new moon to waxing crescent to first quarter to waxing gibbous, full moon, waning gibbous, last quarter or third quarter, uh, waning crescent, and then back to new moon. That whole process takes around four weeks to do. Let me grab another simulation of this just to hopefully show a couple more versions of this that might be uh, more instructive. So let's say the moon is on this side of the Earth and the sunlight's coming in from the left-hand side of this image. And we've got the person uh, sitting there. Basically, we're only going to see the side of the moon that is in shadow. But if we let this run for a little bit, so this is looking at our view of the moon from the Earth. Notice now we're starting to get a little bit of it being illuminated. So let's pause it right around, uh, right around here or so. From this side, if the moon's at this location in its orbit and the sun's coming in from this side, the sunlight is coming in this way, our view of the moon, we would see just a little bit of the left side of that moon being illuminated. The rest of it, we're gonna see in shadow. So we get this waxing crescent. That's the first phase that comes after the new moon phase. If we play this a little bit more as the moon orbits around the earth and this you know, relative geometry of the earth, the sun and the moon changes right around here from the perspective of the earth. If you were on here looking kind of down at this system, you'd see the left side, or sorry, the, the sorry, I said this wrong. Uh, the right side of the moon would be illuminated from your perspective on the earth. So think kind of like look down at this system. The right side would be illuminated. The left side would be in shadow. If we continue playing this, let's speed that up just a little bit so we can get through these phases faster. At this point, well, now from the perspective of the earth, the right side of the moon, from our perspective on the Earth, is has a lot of light, and there's only a little bit that we can't see. Keep on going through that. And by the time the moon is over here, the, the full side of the moon that's illuminated is in our view. So we would see this as a full moon in this case. Once we get past the full moon phase, oh, well now, from our perspective on the Earth, if I'm looking in this direction, it's now the left side of the moon that is more illuminated and just a little sliver on the right that is not illuminated. So that would be our waning gibbous phase going into our third quarter phase where just the left side of the moon is illuminated, then to around the waning crescent phase. And again, this full pattern would take about uh, uh, four weeks to go through this whole set of transitions. So again, just to reiterate this, what ultimately determines the phase of the moon is the relative positions of the sun, the earth, and the moon. Notice in this diagram, the sunlight is now coming in from the right-hand side. So when you're trying to draw these diagrams, you always wanna make sure you're labeling where is the sunlight coming from, and it is that side of the moon that's always going to be illuminated. But again, that's not always the side that is facing the Earth. Uh, if the moon was at this location in its orbit and sunlight's coming in from the right, we wouldn't see any of the illuminated portion of the moon. Going with the moon goes to this location, well, now we just see a little bit on the right-hand side being illuminated. Most of it's in shadow. That would be our waxing crescent. And we can go through all the rest of those phases uh, from first quarter, waxing gibbous, full moon, waning gibbous, third quarter, waning crescent. As I mentioned before in uh, one of the previous sessions, when we're looking at these sorts of diagrams, we're going to assume that we're looking down on the North Pole, which means that the Earth's rotation is counterclockwise. The rotation of the Earth around the Sun is counterclockwise. And also for the Moon, the Moon's orbit around the Earth, when looking from that same perspective, is still going to be counterclockwise. 
Now, as the moon is orbiting around the Earth and going to these different relative locations, the Earth is also rotating underneath the system. So we've got the moon orbiting around the Earth, and the Earth is also rotating on its axis. And over the course of a single day, the moon doesn't move very far in its orbit. So basically, over the course of one day, pretty much everyone on Earth sees the same phase of the moon. Because again, the moon takes four weeks to do a full rotation. So in one day, it doesn't move all that far. So everyone sees approximately the same phase of the moon. But let's put together two pieces of this kind of motion. So let's say we've got sunlight coming in from the side. So we've got sunlight over here. And let's try to make a model of what time of day it is for a person on the rotating Earth. So let's draw the Earth on here. So here's the Earth. And let's say the person is standing on this part of the Earth. Again, sunlight is coming in from the right and hitting our person. So the sunlight would be high overhead. So in this configuration, the time would be around 12 noon. And their horizon, they would be able to see everything above that line, everything in this direction for them. We said that it takes 24 hours for the Earth to rotate once on its own axis. So let's say that this Earth rotates, and let's say it goes through a quarter turn. So the person's now at this location. They've got their horizon. Well, if they've gone through a quarter of a turn from where they were at 12 noon, what time would that correspond with? As always, pause the video when I kind of ask these rhetorical questions, so you can give it your own try, and then we'll talk about it. So if this is a quarter turn, well, that's a quarter of a day, which is about six hours. So this would be 6 p.m. And the sun is going to be setting in the west. I'm actually going to label uh, east and west on this diagram. So this would be east and west. Let's say we went through another quarter turn. So the person's on this side of the Earth. Again, we still have, we're still assuming that the sunlight is always going to be coming in directly from the right. So we've got our person. I didn't really give them a neck, but that's okay. We'll have that person there. And their horizon would be set up like this. So this would be the east. This would be the west. Basically, take the previous picture and just rotate it a quarter turn. So that would be their horizon, and this would correspond to 12 midnight. And one more quarter turn. At this point, the person would be at this location on the Earth. This would be their horizon, east and west. And the sun would be, in this case, rising in the eastern half of the sky. So this would be around 6 a.m. So for a person on the Earth, um, looking at the sky around them, their location on the Earth, relative to the direction that the sunlight is coming in at, that's how we can identify what their local time is. If the sunlight's high overhead, it's 12 noon for that observer. Um, a quarter rotation later, that would be 6 p.m. for that observer. The sun would be setting in the west. Quarter turn after that, it would be midnight for that observer, and we'd have our eastern and western horizon. Quarter turn after that, now the sun is rising in the east, and it would be 6 a.m. for that observer. So this allows us to model where an observer's location is at different times of day or night, relative to the direction of the sunlight and where they are on this rotating Earth. So now 
let's take these two pieces of information and put them together. We said, if the moon is at one of these different locations, we know what phase the moon will appear to be in. Depending on where the observer is on this rotating Earth, that's going to determine their local time. Okay? So we have these two pieces of data. And we want to try to put them together to say, can we predict when different phases of the moon are going to rise, when they're going to be at their highest point in the sky, when are these phases of the moon going to set? Because again, with all of these scientific ideas, we want to make testable predictions. This gets back to the whole science is about developing models of nature that are testable, and then we can go out and check whether these models make accurate predictions. So let's see how this would work. Let's put the pieces of this model together so we can predict when different phases of the moon are going to rise and when they're going to set. Okay. Suppose we're looking at the first quarter moon. The moon is at this location, so it's a first quarter moon. And we have these different positions. So again, these two diagrams match up. The sunlight's coming in from the same side. We want to identify when is the moon going to be rising in the eastern part of the sky? When is it going to be at its highest point in the sky? And when is it going to be setting in the western half of the sky? So we've got these you know, couple pictures. And let's see if we can meld these two ideas together. I want to know when is this first quarter moon going to be on the eastern horizon of our observer on this Earth? Well, if we take this first picture, this 12 noon picture, well, at 12 noon, this is where the observer is going to be on the Earth. This will be their eastern horizon. This will be their western horizon. Which means that this first quarter moon is going to be rising at around noon. Approximately at noon, the moon is going to rise. If it's in this first quarter phase, the moon is going to rise in the eastern half of the sky. When is it going to be at its highest point in the sky? When is it going to be right over top of the observer? Well, at 6 p.m., that's when the moon is going to be high overhead, higher in the sky. It's not going to be close to either my eastern or western horizons. It's going to be high overhead. So it's going to cross from the eastern to western parts of the sky at around 6 p.m. And set in the west at around midnight. This is a testable prediction. You can you know, look up when is the moon going to be in its first quarter phase and then go outside at around noon and see whether or not the moon is rising in the eastern half of the sky. At around 6 p.m., when is it at its highest point in the sky and crossing from the eastern to western parts of the sky? These are things that we can go out and test. At 6 a.m., if we have this first quarter moon at 6 a.m., would you expect to be able to see the first quarter moon? So again, pause the video and think, if we went back to, if it was 6 a.m., do you think we'd be able to see that first quarter moon? Well, let's try to draw this on our diagram. Let's say we've got the person here. That's where they're located at 6 a.m. Their horizon would look like this. So this would be the eastern part of the sky. This would be the western part of the sky. So is that first quarter moon in their local sky, in the region of the sky that they can see? No, not in this case. If it's a first quarter moon, you would not expect to be able to see it at 6 a.m. But let's try another example of this. Let's say I have a, let's go with waning crescent. We're gonna, this one's a little bit more tricky, but let's do a waning crescent. So the waning crescent, it would be at this location. I'm gonna try to draw this as best as I can. This side would be in shadow. So we'll just try to draw that in a little bit. This side would be in shadow and our view, what this would look like would basically be 
there is a little bit of the left side that you can see and the rest would be in darkness. So there'd be a little part of the left-hand side of this thing that you could see. The rest would be in darkness. I'm just making sure that I'm looking at this from the right perspective. Yeah, I think so. Right, I just want to make sure that I'm not flipping that. Uh, yeah, waning crescent is on that side. Just want to make sure I don't make a typo. So that's what the moon would look like from our perspective, but I'm going to get rid of that so it doesn't uh, cause any confusion. Okay. So where would the person have to be if we have this uh, waning gibbous, sorry, waning crescent, This waning crescent, where would we have to be located if we're seeing this thing rising in the eastern horizon? Well, 12 midnight would be a little bit too late. If the moon's over here, 12 midnight would be a little bit too late. If the moon's over here, 6 a.m. would be a little bit too early. So maybe we can interpolate this a little bit. Maybe if the person is right around here, their horizon would kind of cut across this way. So this would be the eastern horizon. This would be the west. And they'd be able to see this thing rising in the, rising in the eastern half of the sky. Approximately what time of day or night would this correspond with? He said it's somewhere in between 12 midnight and 6 a.m. So maybe halfway in between those would be around 3 a.m. So at around 3 a.m., that's when this waning crescent would rise. So this would rise at 3 a.m. Sorry, my pen isn't always writing when I want it to. Sorry about that. We'll rise at around 3 a.m. Okay, well, when is it going to reach its highest point in the sky? Well, it's going to be at a different location. Let's erase some of these parts. When it's at its highest point in the sky, it should be directly overhead of my observer. So that would be our... Try that again. Our eastern and western parts of the sky. Well, this looks like it's partway in between the 6 a.m. location and the 12 noon location. So maybe this is around 9 a.m. So it would be highest, highest overhead. And is bothering me a little bit. Uh, highest at 9 a.m. And when would it be setting in the west? Well, let's try another quarter turn. So when the person's on this side, quarter turn later, we have our eastern and western parts of the sky. This would be about halfway between the 12 noon and 6 p.m. So let's call that 3 p.m. So that's when it would set. So again, this allows us to make these different predictions. We've, we've developed a model you know, kind of a, a spatial model, a geometric model of how the direction that sunlight's coming at, where the moon is in its orbit around the Earth, and where our location on the Earth is, which determines what time it is for us, we can use this model to make 
testable predictions. And then you can look up, well, what phase of the moon do we have tonight or something like that? Go out and try to observe the moon at these different times and see if it matches up with these predictions of when it's in the eastern, near the eastern horizon, when it's high in the sky, when it's near the western horizon. So that's basically all I wanted to talk about for the moon phases. Um, there could be times where you're expected to draw these diagrams and try to make these predictions. But a couple of the main things to think about, at least for now, is that depending on what phase of the moon is, when it rises, when it sets, when you can see it, those are going to be different depending on what phase the moon is in. A lot of the time, whenever the moon's on this side of its orbit around the sun, it's visible for at least part of the day. You know, when the sun is still out, you might be able to see it, even though it's kind of hard to see it when it's in the new moon phase, just because it's not being illuminated. You can't see the illuminated side as much. Uh, the moon can be in the sky during the daytime, it's about half the time. And identifying how the different observers on the Earth, remember, if I just wait for a day, everyone's going to be able to see the, uh, the moon in this position. Uh, so over the course of a single day, everyone sees basically the same phase of the moon. Those are some of the key things that I want to uh, highlight with this portion, but we'll call that good for this particular session.